like, you know, when you have, if you have something, but you know, the other there. Yeah. Possibly. And then when you're talking about cardio, are you talking about medication you do? Just like, when they're going so fast that you give it and it stops it? Adenosine? Yeah. Uh, cardio version. Um, the one I was showing okay. was the actual with the defibrillator pads and everything. Okay. Oh wait.
So these interventions, what intervention the patient has depends on multiple things. One, what is the patient's overall clinical profile? What have they had done before? What's their cardiac um, history? Have they had stents before? Has that been successful? Has it not? Okay. Now, physician's preference does play into it a little bit, but mainly it's like what is the best long-term um, fix to the solution? Okay. So remember, we always try at least invasive first. So because if this doesn't work, if medications don't work, we do these interventions and they don't work, well, unfortunately, our, our next step is we've got to do like open heart surgery. Okay. So when you're doing these interventions, your pre-op is exactly the same as it was for a cardiac catheterization, guys, because remember, they get through all these as a cardiac catheterization. So they go through a major artery. It could be femoral, brachial, somewhere. Okay. And they use guide wires and they look at the chambers of the heart. When they determine there is a blockage, then the cardiologist determines what type of method he wants to remove the blockage. Okay. But your pre-op is exactly the same. So when you look at your labs, check for iodine allergies. All those things you did for a cardiac catheterization, you're doing them because this is an intervention. Your post-op care, again, is exactly the same. They're going to be on bed rest for a prescribed amount of time. That depends on, one, the closure device, and two, what kind of interventions did they do. Okay. The only thing I'd like to add to that is if your patient starts developing any chest pain, it requires prompt intervention because if they start developing chest pain after an intervention, what that tells you is that there's an occlusion somewhere. Something happens and this vessel that they opened up, it became restenosed again. It closed up. So then what would happen is that the cardiologist would take the individual back to the cath lab and try and open it back up, figure out what happened, okay? So these interventions, they have the same pre-op and the same post-op as a cardiac catheterization. We just did different, different methods of fixing the problem, okay? I want you to watch a PTC, PTCA. It's not very long, it's only like 10 minutes, but what I want you to make note of is look at the vessel, guys. Prior to this, and I told you, this guy came in, he had an acute MI. His vessel was really, really small, and they opened it up really, really to its full size, which is absolutely awesome. They do that, then they have aborted the heart attack. Okay, so you're going to see all these things to talk about. You're going to see the cardiac mm -hmm. catheterization. They go through a femoral artery on him. You're going to see where they inject um, medication to try and help vasodilate and help with the coronary spasms. You're going to see the little thread wire and they're going to release the dye and you'll see how the heart kind of lights up and what the blockages are. And then you're going to see how he does the clot removal and he puts the stent. Okay. And we talk about it and we seem like it's a really long process, but really it's not. It's about 10 minutes is what this one is. But this is just for one stent. Some people have to have multiple stents, but this is just one. So let me... This is a 57-year-old uh, gentleman who presented with a non-ST segment elevation MI and continued chest discomfort and rising troponins. He's here for a cardiac cath to investigate his coronary anatomy. Little pinch and a burn, sir. So we are going to access the coronary arteries via the right femoral artery. We'll first numb up over the vessel. It's a little pressure, sir. A little pressure in the leg there, sir. All right. 
right? And we put a sheath into the femoral artery in order to pass the catheters. <clears throat> the first catheter that we place is called a pigtail catheter because of its shape. And we're going to measure pressures inside the heart and outside the heart. The pigtail catheter is now outside the aortic valve. And we'll now cross the aortic valve to measure the left ventricular pressure, retrograde here with the pigtail catheter. All right, we now have a catheter inside the heart, inside the left ventricle. Inject. We're going to look at the arteries that supply blood to the heart, the coronary arteries, using catheters that will select the coronary arteries. And we're going to start with the left. And so far, so good. All right. We're taking a picture of the left coronary artery, the left circumflex artery, the left, the left anterior ascending coronary artery supplies blood to the top and the front of the heart, and the left circumflex supplies blood to the posterior portion of the heart or the back of the heart. Okay, now we're going to look at the right coronary artery. Supplies blood to the bottom part of the heart. So the right coronary artery is totally occluded. And he's been having See how nothing's going down. symptoms intermittently for the last couple of days. So we're going to open up the right coronary artery. He's had, uh, looks like a little bit of damage to the bottom part of the heart, which you see in this picture here. And that's the part of the heart that's supplied by the right coronary artery. So this gentleman has an occluded right coronary artery, which is likely recent. His last prolonged episode of chest discomfort was today. So he's having ongoing discomfort. Um, he has a, a damage to the inferior or bottom wall of the heart, which suggests that he's in the process of having a what we call myocardial infarction or heart attack. The left system looks fine. So we are going to go ahead and open up the uh, right coronary artery. So what we're first going to do is we're going to uh, access the right coronary artery with a special type of a catheter called a guiding catheter. Place a wire across the blockage and then pass a catheter that will remove uh, clot from the vessel. In patients who have acute coronary syndromes or acute heart attacks, these are from, from clot and plaque. And so to make the artery ready for the stent, we need to withdraw uh, some of the clot. So we're going to do that with a specialized catheter first. Right now we're placing a guide catheter into the right coronary artery, which is occluded. So on the bottom screen, we're going to show, we're going to show the vessel as it is now, that I could use for a road map. And then we're going to improve that vessel to normal. So the first thing we need to do before we uh, place equipment into the artery is place a wire, uh, manipulate a wire across the blockage in order to place all of our equipment. So we have a wire going into the artery here. Okay, so we've gotten the wire across the blockage. What we're going to do is place this catheter beyond the blockage if possible. And then through the catheter, with negative suction, attempt to remove the clot that caused this artery to block suddenly this morning. And then we'll take a look at the artery and see how it looks once we do all that. I'm going to take a quick shot after the export catheter has been passed. Go ahead. All right, so the artery's open. It just looks small. OK, now that we've restored flow in the vessel, we're going to use a balloon to open up the artery and use some nitroglycerin to get rid of some of the spasm. So now with the balloon, we opened up the critical blockage, but we still see a lot of thrombus in the vessel past the blockage. So we're going to put what's called the export catheter back down and withdraw a little bit more clot from there. So after one pass with the export catheter and one inflation with the balloon, the artery is open and we're able to see beyond the blockage now and see what work needs to be done to restore blood flow through the artery. So now we're, we have the export catheter be way down the artery here, way below the 
blockage itself, and we're withdrawing clot as we pull the catheter back through the artery. We're now withdrawing the export catheter from the distal part or the end of the artery back through the blockage and back into the catheter so we can eradicate the clot all the way through the vessel. Look how big that artery is. The bottom picture is a picture of the artery is a picture of the artery before we started, and the top picture is after several passes to remove clot throughout the vessel, and then an angioplasty or a balloon inflation in the beginning of the artery. As you can see, it looked like a little stub of an artery, now it's a huge vessel. So now that we're, we have blood flow down the artery, we're going to finish the procedure by stenting the vessel. And it looks like it needs stents in two spots. There's a lot of clot. There's, a, there's a, a, a large amount of what we call thrombus burden in this vessel. That's primarily because it's, a, it's an acute problem. This happened to him over the last couple of days, culminating in a prolonged episode of chest discomfort today. Uh, and as you can see, the reason for the prolonged discomfort today is that the artery was completely closed, causing a heart attack. So we went in and we, knowing clinically that there was a lot of clot in there, even though we couldn't see it, we went in and used the clot removing device before we got started. If you don't do that, you can really get into a lot of trouble with the vessel and have a very difficult time opening the vessel if you don't first remove thrombus. So we made several passes with the uh, thrombus removal device called the export catheter uh, and actually we had a very nice result. And now we're going to finish the procedure by doing it by stenting. That's after one pass of the export catheter. So the first picture is there, the second picture after one pass of just the clot, and then we made two more passes with the export vessel, uh, export catheter, and one inflation with a balloon in the beginning of the artery. And that's how we ended up with this. And now we're going to put stents in this artery. So we'll put the 3 out distal, just at the crux. This is a 3 by 15 and we're going to put that right about there. The stent is, is deployed, crimped on a balloon, and we expand the balloon, which is what we're doing right now, and that will leave the stent in the vessel. The balloon will then come down, and the stent will remain fully expanded in the vessel. So right now we are <coughs> forcing the stent, for lack of a better word, into the wall of the artery with a high pressure balloon. And in about 30 seconds, we'll remove the balloon and leave the stent. The first stent we placed at the, in the distal most part of the artery, which is at the end of the artery. And this is the stent that will go in the proximal part of the artery. So you can see the stent material, which is uh, a uh, stainless steel or a cobalt chromium alloy. They're the two different stents that we now use in, in, in coronaries. And the stent is, is crimped on a balloon. You can't, you can't really appreciate the balloon, but it's under there because it's uninflated. What we'll do is we'll put the stent in the artery uh, over that wire, and then we'll inflate the balloon, which is under the stent, and that'll deploy the stent into the wall of the vessel, and then we'll deflate the balloon and pull the balloon out, leaving the stent behind in the vessel. Now the stent is in there, and you'll see the balloon inflate. And the balloon is inflating. We're now removing the balloon, which is deflated. We use nitroglycerin to treat the spasm that can occur inside the artery when you are when you're working inside the artery. Sometimes that creates vasospasm or in the vessel. And we're finished. Both stents are deployed. The artery is wide open. The flow is excellent. And his heart attack is aborted. So that's the artery before we started. And the top is the artery following thrombus removal, balloon angioplasty, and finally uh, intracoronary stenting in the vessel. So it's actually a large vessel. It can be sometimes deceiving. It looks small when we started, but it's a very large vessel. Is that not cool? That's very cool. I mean, so that's everything that we just talked about kind of in a nutshell. So how long were the stents good for? Um, the stents, hold on, let me turn this off. It's very individualized um, for the person, but most
people get at least 10 years out of them, okay? Um, some get more because the biggest thing you have to realize, your patient has to be compliant with, um, yeah, you know, take your medicine, stop smoking, heart healthy diet, exercise. So the more they do that, the longer they can get out of that stint. And that is the least, one of the, the I should say, um, it's not as invasive as open heart surgery. Yeah. So we definitely would want our um, patient to be compliant with that. However, realize that sometimes um, you're, you do have some re -stenosis, okay? Like we do everything, uh, or they can do everything, and sometimes they, they just get re okay? Sometimes it's um, a, a genetic component, but we do have something we can do for that, um, we can do something we call brachiotherapy. So this is pretty cool. This is, we have found to be most beneficial with people that are either diabetic or they have um, peripheral vascular disease and so they have smaller vessels because those people, their vessels tend to be um, fragile and so they occlude a lot easier. So this brachiotherapy, what we do, it's a special cardiac catheterization procedure where we administer intracoronary radiation to try and help um, the, the stent become unstenosed. Okay. Uh, the people that see the most benefit from it, obviously, are our diabetic patients because it can reduce the rate of restenosis by up to 50%. That's really good because our next step, guys, from this is open heart surgery. Why do we not want to do any type of surgery on a diabetic patient? Yeah, wound healing. Okay, so we don't want to do surgery on diabetic patients because they are just, they are very poor wound healers. Everything's delayed with them. And so we'll try and do this brachiotherapy to, to ride that stent out as long as we can. Or oftentimes we will, if it's able, we'll do multiple stents in this individual just to try and pre prevent that. But if medications don't work, and the stents don't work, or maybe the blockage is in a place where we can't really reach um, with this procedure, then we have to do open heart surgery, okay? We refer to that as a cabbage. That stands for coronary artery bypass grafting. So in a cabbage, essentially, and it's in your book, 767 to 774, but a cabbage basically, all we do is we bypass the blocked coronary arteries. That's it. We like to use the patient's own arterial or venous vessels. If they're not a candidate, then we can actually use a synthetic graft. Okay? But all we do is we take the person's own vessels and, like, for example, right here, you see where it's blocked? All the CB surgeon will do is he'll just take that vein or that artery and he will attach it um, to where the blood is diverted this way and doesn't even go through that little blockage. Now, a person can have multiple cabbages or multiple blockages. So terminology, when you are looking at the chart and it says like cabbage times five, what that means is that person has had five vessels replaced, okay? They had five occluded vessels that they bypassed. Yeah, it is a lot, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but we've had them before. So if someone just has one vessel, let's say that they just have, um, they just need one vessel replaced. A lot of times what we'll use is we'll use the internal mammary artery. We really like that one because um, it starts life as an artery. And remember when you're in the, um, when you're in the heart, you do arteries there. And so it does, it does well. However, if a person has to have multiple grafts, for example, if it's that one that has five occlusions that we gotta, that's not gonna be enough. And so then what we do is we'll do like a venous mapping study of their legs to determine if they're a good candidate, like what leg would be better. Or sometimes if they're not a candidate there, they'll look at the, um, the brachial and they'll look and see, hey, which one is a good candidate for this? And then what we'll do is um, they will just remove the saphenous vein that's our favorite one to use and we can do multiple grafts with the saphenous vein. Because remember the saphenous vein is a long vein through your leg. Okay? And so that cabbage times five right there. The only problem with that, it's a vein. And we're taking a vein and trying to put it in a high pressure where your artery needs to be. 
sometimes it doesn't work out. Some people are fine and have absolutely no problems, but other people, when you try and put that vein in there and have it do the work of the artery, it doesn't work as well. Okay, so that is one of the, um, the downfalls of using a vein. Synthetic grafts, if the patient, we always like to use the patient if they're a candidate, but if they're not a candidate, then we can use synthetic grafts. Okay, so that's another, that's another viable option. Okay, but realize that cabbage is the most common type of cardiac surgery that you perform in the United States. Okay, now in Blackboard under Module B, I have videos to watch and it's, it's actually open heart surgery, so it's pretty cool. Um, it's about, there's three of them. I put two up there and each one of them is about 20 minutes. If you don't get real, if, if you don't get queasy real easy, watch it because it's pretty cool because it shows them spreading the, the rib spreaders and getting to the heart and actually suturing um, everything on. Okay, but I know not everybody's, you know, they can't handle watching all that, but it makes it, everything make more sense as far as the pre-op and the post-op post -op when you actually see the procedure and, and what's being done. Okay. Is it time for me to go? Yes, no. ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Oh. <laughs> you better stop. <laughs> So let's talk about pre-op. What do we need to do for a person that's going down for open heart surgery? We have lots of stuff to do, okay? Uh, we need to make sure their consents yeah. are signed, okay? They'll have consents for the procedure, they'll have consents for blood. Surgery will come and get their own consents. We need to look at lab work, okay? Um, I listed some of the lab work we wanna, we wanna make sure and we look at. We do a chest x-ray and an EKG just for a baseline, guys, so that we have a comparison when they come back from the procedure. Uh, we will go ahead and prep uh, Hippoclin scrub three times before, okay? Usually one the night before and two the morning of. Uh, we don't shave, we clip now, okay? So we'll use the clippers and the only hair they get to keep, but they get to keep the hair on top of their head and their eyebrows. Everything else is gone, okay? And think about it, they're gonna have lots and lots of invasive lines. So anywhere there's hair, there is a potential portal for entry or you have a risk for infection. So we try and get rid of all of that. Like their arm hair, they have multiple IVs. Um, for our guys, like their back hair, chest hair, all that, we take and get rid of all of it, okay? Uh, the other things we wanna make sure and do is we do cultures. And the reason we do cultures is because we wanna make sure they don't have an ongoing infection, okay? Especially when Obamacare came in, there was some changes to reimbursements. And so realize um, if a person develops a f an infection in the hospital, then it's considered a hospital acquired, and so they're not reimbursed for that. But some people are just carriers um, of MRSA. I mean, if you were to swab a lot of nurses, a lot of us would carry MRSA. I don't get swabbed. I just say treat it. You know, swabbing. I, want, I don't want to be in an isolation room, and I don't want my tray on a styrofoam. So, but that's, but over 50% of us are carriers in MRSA. And it's okay because we're not sick. But when you're sick, that's when the MRSA infection will mess you up. So we need to know that because if they have MRSA, they're a carrier of it, but let's say we don't do cultures, so after 48 hours where they're in the hospital, then it's considered a hospital-acquired condition when it truly wasn't hospital-acquired, they're just a carrier of it. So what that means is, with the changes in payouts, the hospital will not be reimbursed for the surgery and for any care it takes to treat the MRSA. They're out a lot of money. So now, that's why there are certain populations that we always um, will culture when they come in because they're at a high risk setting, for example, like our nursing home patients. Typically when your nursing home patient comes in, you're gonna do an air culture to make sure they don't have MRSA. Because if something has to be cultured later and it shows that they have it, you at least have proof that mm -mm, they had it coming in. And so then the hospital will get reimbursed. The other reason that we do, um, we do cultures is because typically they will do more than one cabbage a day. Not a lot more, typically two cabbages. Um, if an emergency comes in, of course. but we like to do our clean cases first, so our infection-free cases are always first, and then our dirty cases, and that's not what I call them, that's what surgery calls them, okay? Because I know that sounds really horrible, but they're called dirty cases. They are last. And you can kind of see the, the rationale for that because, you know, let's get everybody that doesn't have an infection first, and then let's take care of, because we don't want to cross-contaminate. Everybody tries to be as careful as possible, but you know, anytime you have that human element involved, there always is the potential 
for some cross-contamination there. So other things we will do, um, we will get a pre-op weight. The reason we want to get a weight when they come in prior to having open heart surgery is one of our goals is they have to be back to baseline. Okay, they have to be back to that baseline weight. When they have this procedure, it is very common for them to get a large amount of fluid on them. Okay, it's just the nature of it. We put them on that um, the cardiopulmonary bypass machine, and so we dilute a lot, and so it's easy for them to gain anywhere from 10 to 15 pounds following the surgery. We have to know how much fluid to, that they need to be packed. And so the way we do that is if their baseline is 210 and they're currently right now 230 and it's post-op day three, got some work to do. We get the fluid out by diuresing them. And so in addition to getting that pre-op weight, we're gonna get daily weights. Daily weights typically in this population, they need to be on the, the bedside scales. No um, scales with the bed. Okay, you know how you can weigh them on the bed? We don't want that. Because it's very, it can change. Um, depending on, you know, how many sheets they have and all that. And see, they're writing orders for diuretics daily. So we need to know what is their, their current weight. Okay. Uh, we also want to teach about post-op care. This is so important to do before surgery, guys. So they know going in what to expect. It's better to be prepared. And we have found that our patient outcomes improve when your patients are more informed and they're more involved in the day-to-day -day management of their care. So some things we talk about. Well, number one for me is pain management. Okay, I don't know about y'all, but I like my pain rating to always be at a zero. I mean, it's realistic for me. But after open heart surgery, it's not realistic to expect a pain of a zero at all times. Remember, they cracked open your chest and played with your heart. It's going to hurt. So we talk about let's be realistic with your pain. So oftentimes a pain goal of a zero, while it's not realistic, um, we kind of gear more towards, well, how about a two or a three, okay? We want to get the pain to where it's manageable, okay? Uh, more like the way I describe it is I usually say a toothache, okay? It's a toothache that you can manage things with because we all have had a toothache, and while, yes, it's there and you're aware of it, you're still able to do other things. It's not like excruciating for the most part and you just can't do anything. So that's usually um, the first thing we talk about. Also, you have to gauge your, your patients. The problem we have with our older patients, they don't like to take pain medicine because they're scared they're gonna get addicted, okay? Um, you gotta inform them if you truly are hurting, then you're not gonna get addicted to pain medicine because what you will find is your older people, they will hold off as long as they can before getting that. And the problem is that's gonna, again, impede the healing process because if you hurt, you're not going to want to move. You're not going to want to take deep breaths. You're just going to want to be there as still as you can, and that's not what we want. The other thing we want to talk to them about, we want to talk to them about, hey, are you working? What we have found is that our population having open heart surgery are getting younger and younger. Okay. That being said, a lot of people work in their 60s, guys, Okay. even in their 70s. And so the thing about this type of surgery, it's not like a, in two weeks you'll be able to go back to work. No, it takes most people about six months to get back to baseline. That's six months. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I got two kids and two cats that eat a lot. If I wouldn't work for six months, they'd be, well, everybody would be skinny. Maybe that's an idea, but <laughs> can't do it. Most of your patients are like that, guys. We can't just assume, so you actually have to talk to them about, you know, do you work? If you work, what kind of job do you have? If it's something that's very um, hands-on, like for example, they work in construction or they work in extreme conditions, then they're not gonna be able to go back to that probably, maybe never, but if they do, it's gonna be at least a year out, okay? Because we gotta get them fully recovered. And so sometimes you find you might have to get social services involved to help maybe with that um, short-term disability process, okay? We also want to talk about who are they going to have to help them with. After surgery, it, they're going to be on restrictions. They're on driving restrictions. They're on weight restrictions. So we got to kind of determine, hey, who can help you? What we found is some people don't have anybody to help them. Okay? We encourage most of our people, instead of transitioning straight home, we encourage them to go to cardiac rehab. So that's where we like most of our people because it just makes that transition a little smoother. But again, not everybody
can go to cardiac rehab. Basically, if you don't have insurance, you can't go to cardiac rehab. Okay. Um, and so we talk about all those. Uh, we also talk about the process. We let them know. Typically, after open heart surgery, you're in the unit for 24 to 48 hours. Uncomplicated, of course. Okay, no complications. You usually are, I mean, we can even fast track them sometimes and be out in under 12. It just kind of depends. Okay. But 24 to 48 is typically your, your main goal. And then after that, what happens is they transition to a step-down unit. And they'll be on that step-down unit until discharge. So for an uncomplicated um, open heart surgery, your average length of stay is about five to seven days. That's it. Okay? And that's not a long time. So that's why you have to start educating early and trying to get the patient involved and trying to get the family involved early so they're aware of them. So you kind of let them know. You let them know that they are going to have to move after surgery. Okay? People don't want to move because it hurts. So you let them know you, you're, you're going to have to move. Typically, um, after 24 hours, we're getting up and we're walking them. They'll have chest tubes, they'll have foleys, they'll have all these drains, but they're still walking. Now, we'll medicate them, of course, but we need them up walking. And not, I'm not saying like they have to walk in the hall, but they gotta, they got to walk. Why do we want to promote early ambulation? What does it prevent? DVT. Yeah, DVTs, blood clots. It promotes GI mobility. We want that, that gut to start moving because remember when they're put to sleep, everything's put to sleep. Okay? We also want them to use their incentive spirometer. Ooh. Why do we want them to use their incentive spirometer? Does hurt? So it does hurt, but why do we want them to use it? Expand their lungs. Expand their lungs, yeah, so we don't have to worry about pneumonia. Okay? So again, we're going to keep them medicated, but these are things that, you know, if you got to cough or if you got to take a deep breath, Let's use that pillow. That pillow is going to be their friend. Okay. Incentive spirometer. A lot of people don't know how to use this incentive spirometer. They don't use it correctly. And so I always tell people, remember, it is a suck, not a blow. I tell people, and I have found that most clients do better when they can visualize something. Make it relatable. Okay. Then they'll remember. So I hold up my incentive spirometer. I say, okay, you see this? This is a vanilla milkshake from Sonic. Because most people have had a, a milkshake from Sonic. This is your straw. Stick it in your mouth and try and suck it up. So then, when you're not there telling them, they'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, this is a milkshake. Most people don't blow into the straw and milkshake. They suck it up. Mm -hmm. So they're going to remember. But little things like that, guys, it keeps it in their brain, and they will remember. We want them to do that 10 times every hour while they're awake. And it doesn't seem like much, but it really is when, you're <laughs> when you hurt. Mm -hmm. But we need all that. We need all that. So we tell them that. Other thing we like to tell them, if you were able to cut your food up and eat your food prior to surgery, then we're going to want you to do that after surgery. So sometimes you got to um, gently remind their partner that we didn't operate on their arms. They can eat. <laughs> because think about it, guys. We only have about five days to really figure out what, what resources do they need. Okay. And what you have to find is most of the time, um, their partners, especially our men, their partners like to help them out maybe a little too much to begin with. Okay, um, And so sometimes we, we do have to be like, let them cut up their food, let them eat, let them hold their urinal. Okay, They got it. Those types of things. Because if we take that Foley out post-op day one, we don't let them keep it in. Because remember, we want them moving. Most people don't want to pee in their bed, so they're going to get out of that bed and go to the bathroom. Same reason why we don't let them have a bedside commode. Okay? We want them to do more than just plop from one to the other. We want them to walk. Now, of course, there's always going to be certain conditions where you're, you're going to need that. For the, but for the majority of our people, they can walk assisted to the bathroom, and that's what we want them to do. Just a little bit of movement is better than no movement. And so we talk about all that before. The other thing we really want to... Uh, Mention is medications. Most of the time prior to the surgery, your patient is on a lot of medications, okay, for their CAD. Anywhere from 10, 15, upwards. Well, we're fixed that problem. We have opened up all of their vessels now. So they're not going to be on that amount of medication. And so just make them aware of it because some people do get really upset when you mess with their meds. So let them know, hey, Typically, we only keep you around four or five meds. 
And then if we need to, we'll add them on. But oftentimes we'll hold the blood pressure medicines, um, we'll hold all that kind of stuff to see how they're gonna do on their own. Usually when they come out, uh, they'll be on things like an aspirin, okay? Uh, 325 aspirin. They'll be on um, usually a nitro patch. That's going to help with vasodilation. They'll be on like fish oil. Fish oil helps with, um, it helps prevent um, dysrhythmias, specifically atrial dysrhythmia because that's the most common um, dysrhythmia after open heart surgery. Uh, they'll be on vitamin C. Why are they on vitamin C, guys? What's it help with? It helps with wound healing. Remember, vitamin C promotes wound healing. They'll be on iron because they typically are a little anemic. Okay? And then will a beta blocker, we usually like a beta blocker only because it makes their heart work smarter, not as hard, as long as they meet parameters with their heart rate and their blood pressure. So that's really all, they'll just be on that little handful. And then we'll add on as needed. So just let them know that prior to, okay? Because it does freak some people out when you don't bring their meds or you don't bring them on time or you don't bring all of them, okay? So once they go to surgery, what happens is they are actually put on a cardiopulmonary bypass machine, okay? So remember that's just a machine that diverts blood from the heart to this bypass machine. Once it's in the bypass machine, we heparinize it, we oxygenate it, and then we turn it back to circulation. Okay. The other thing we do is we're going to lower their body temp. Okay, because remember it doesn't consume as much oxygen. So we um, lower it to around 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Then what happens is we give a potassium infusion to the heart and it's going to stop it. Then an incision is in is is made and the bypasses the little grafts are sutured in by the cardiologist okay that's a cabbage in a nutshell but watch them it's pretty cool okay under module b i have links right there to them so you can go at the very bottom okay when they come out things you need to be aware of once surgery is done they're going to be in the critical care unit for 12 to 24 hours okay they're going to be on a ventilator they're gonna have chest tubes. When they're on the ventilator, they're sedated. Chest tubes are gonna help with drainage. So for you, as far as taking care of the chest tubes, the biggest thing you can do is you wanna make sure that the chest tubes aren't kinked anywhere. So the chest tubes typically is three chest tubes and they're kind of placed like this around the heart because remember our heart's kind of right here in the middle. And what it helps with, it helps promote the drainage, okay? But you'll just have one connector and you'll have one big tube right here. So you want to check from where the insertion site is to the atrium where it's connected and make sure that it's not kinked anywhere. Because if it's kinked, it's not draining. The whole purpose of the chest tube is to drain that blood from around the heart. Okay. The other thing you want to make note of, you want to make sure at the beginning of your shift that you look at your output from that um, chest tube. You're going to measure it hourly. Guys, if you have more than 150 mLs in an hour, there's something wrong. You better be calling the physician shouldn't have that much output in an hour. Okay. You're going to have pacing wires. The reason they put in pacing wires and, um, is because sometimes the heart gets very irritated when we manipulate it. And so it won't work like it should. So the pacing wires just allow us to externally pace the heart. Okay. We have to worry about dysrhythmias. And again, those pacing wires are going to help with that. Remember the most common dysrhythmia is going to be AFib, but they could also have some blocks, or they could have some um, some sinus brady, some things that we're going to have to try and intervene for. You're going to really need to maintain and watch your fluid status. We typically put on a lot of extra fluid with the surgery, so um, we're going to have to diurese them. The other thing is when you put on all this extra surgery, like when they go through that bypass machine, it dilutes all your electrolytes. Okay, so oftentimes their electrolytes will not be um, in balance. So typically we do daily checks, um, like the BMPs, the mags, potassiums. We do daily checks on those. Hypothermia, remember we lowered them to 95, so our whole goal is we got to get them back up to 98.6. Okay, we do that with like the bare um, devices or the blankets, those types of things. Bleeding is a major concern. 
So we're watching our chest tube, at, um, our chest tube, and making sure and monitoring our output. We're looking at all of our incisions, making sure we're not having excessive bleeding on any of our incisions. Uh, and hand in hand with that, we're doing level of consciousness checks once they're not sedated on the vent. Okay, you can't really do a level of consciousness when they're sedated, but once they're not sedated, we're checking them. You follow your hospital's protocol, but it's very frequently. And the reason that is, is because, remember, sometimes you can have a bleeding in the brain, and so one of your first indicators of that is, is to change their level of consciousness. Okay, so we want to make sure and check that. Again, pain is a major concern here, and it's a valid concern. While they're in the unit, they get pain medicine around the clock. But then once they go um, to one of the step down units, because our goal is to try and transition them home, we make the pain medicine PRN. Sometimes we forget to tell the patients that. So they think you're bringing them pain medicine and you keep waiting for them to tell you they want something. So you wanna do a pain checks frequently and you wanna try and keep them comfortable, okay? Because that first, after that first day, they're getting up and walking around, okay? We'll give them pain medicine, but we have got to mobilize them um, as early as we can. So these are all the things that we're doing post-op to get them back where they need to. The other thing we really gotta make it, make sure we're checking is vital signs very frequently. We worry about hypotension and hypertension. So let me tell you why I worry about hypotension. So they are suturing grafts on to the heart, okay? If we don't have sufficient blood flow, which means they have a low blood pressure, then what happens is that graft can collapse. When the graft collapses, blood's not able to go through it. So remember how we tried to divert it to go all the way to where the area is that it needs to go? It can no longer go there. On the other end, though, we worry about hypertension because they sutured the grafts. If the blood pressure is too high, what that means is they can actually leak and blow out around the, around the suture sites. So that's why we really got to keep them within those normal limits. We don't want them to go either way, because either way is bad for them. Okay. Now, the other thing I like to talk about a little bit here is I like to talk about your harvest sites. Remember I told you they like to use, if it's just one, we'll use the internal mammary artery. Okay? But if it's more than one, we like to use the saphenous vein. This is your saphenous vein right here. We have two ways that we can harvest it. Okay? We can do something we call a short incision. So in a short incision, what the, uh, and usually it's the physician assistant that does this while everybody's prepping them for surgery. So he will make an incision right here at the top, kind of right by the groin right here, and then he'll make another incision right here. And what he'll do is he'll snip it on one end and he'll pull it out the other end. Okay? And then you have like two, they're like an inch, inch long incisions. And he'll close those with Dermabond. Okay? That's the preferred method because think about it, I only have two little incisions that are closed with Dermabond. So one that reduces my likelihood of developing an infection. Or dehiscence. The other way they do it is something we call a long incision. So this long incision is for people that have veins that are really hard to get to, or maybe they have a lot of, um, I mean, they got like chunky legs, and it's hard to get to them. That's when the PA actually has to open them up. And you see it is a very long incision. The reason we worry about this is, remember, I told you in this procedure that they're going to put on extra fluid. Where does our fluid go to? Yeah, it goes down here. I know Dr. Whitaker's group, she told y'all about, I uh, had, to, had to educate her on some uh, CHFers and some things that they'll experience. <laughs> she, she wasn't supposed to share my exact words that I, that I said, but she told me she did. But remember, fluid goes downward. And so the problem with that is, if you have an incision right here, okay, you know you're gonna have fluid that they're gonna swell and it's gonna go down here, you have to worry about dehiscence. Guys, remember dehiscence is all, all it's saying is this incision is spread open again. Well, then you have to worry about infection, guys, because look how big it is. Okay? So, we, gotta, we don't like this, but if you have a long incision, you better watch it carefully for any signs of dehiscence. Okay? The other thing you have to be aware of is with the, the vein that the leg was harvested, the circulation is not as good on that leg. Okay, because it's missing a, it's missing a vein. 
and the patient is fine, but just some things to let them know. That leg is typically a little cooler than the other leg. That leg tends to swell a little bit more than the other leg. So oftentimes we'll tell them, hey, when you're sitting down, let's elevate it. Because it will, that leg will just swell up and the other one will be fine. So we just let them know. Other things because we know they don't have as good as perfusion, we don't really want them crossing their legs. So remember when you cross your legs, you impede your circulation even more, okay? So those are just some little things that um, we talk about. Now, with this procedure, there are some other complications that could arise. Um, you could have dehiscence of either the harvest site or you could even have it of the sternum. Okay, this is a bad one right here. That's what happened here. This lady had um, a sternal infection and she had dehiscence. So it had to heal from the inside out. So she had a wound back the whole nine yards. So you could have dehiscence. Another complication could be infection. It could be infection at the harvest site or infection in the sternum. The problem is, remember, your sternum is a bone. Remember in 105 you learned about infections in the bones? Bad, bad, bad. It's hard to heal. Typically what we have to do in this scenario, we have to, we, I say we, the CV surgeon goes in there and cleans out as much as that infected bone as possible. Can you live without a sternum? Yes, but think about what all your sternum protects. A lot, okay? So that's what we'll do. And then um, we'll have them on heavy dose antibiotics, long term. And then sometimes we'll even do like vancomycin washes. We'll put tubes in there and have continuous vancomycin washes go in there. And we can even do wound backs. The other thing that could happen is they could develop a cardiac tympanon. So that's why you want to keep a check on your chest tubes and make sure it's not kinked anywhere, that it's actually, the output is um, coming like it should. They could develop pleural effusions. Okay, most pleural effusions do resolve on their own. Um, and usually what happens here is we just pulled the chest tubes too early. And that's what caused it. Okay. So those are all complications that, that could arise. So the other thing I always like to tell people is we have other options. You just don't see them that often. We can do something we call an off-pump bypass. It's pretty cool. So with an off-pump bypass, the person is never put on that heart-lung bypass machine. They have better outcomes. They have a shorter hospital stay. So essentially what happens here is this is where the CV surgeon, the heart is beating the entire time. They slow it down by giving lots of beta blockers, okay? Um, but they use this little clamp, and it's called an octopus clamp, and it just stabilizes the area where they're going to perform the surgery at, okay? Not everybody's a candidate for that. That's why we don't do it all the time. I can imagine operating on a beating heart. you got to be really good mm -hmm. and really fast. Okay, um, we do have, we do perform this, like at Southeast, they do have some, they have um, a CV surgeon that will do it. It's just, there's not that many candidates for it, okay. Another type that we can do, we can do one that's called minimally invasive. This is where we don't actually split the sternum. So again, shorter hospital stay, better recovery process. What happens here is we go in through the rib, we take like a two inch incision in the left rib. And we remove just a little piece and we use the Da Vinci to go in there and help. So this is only for people that have a blockage on the left anterior descending artery only. So that's why you don't see it that often because most people, if they're gonna have a blockage, they have more than just one, okay? But it's an option. Look at y'all, y'all are like, <laughs> so, I don't know if you looked at your calendar, but I looked at my calendar, and we have simulation Monday. I know you're so excited. Your job is to save the patient. Carl Shapiro is his name. Okay? Hey, hey, you're about to save him. You're about to save him. I thought you were about to say it's cancel. Cancel? Cancel? <laughs> <laughs> Look, <laughs> if it's just me running it, we'll run it. Okay, so 
let me show you. Cancel. I want to show. I want to go into the uh, our course real quick.